City of Stevens Point Board of Park Commissioners Meeting, recorded March 3, 2021. It's 6.30, so good evening, everybody. It's uh, time to start the regular meeting, the March meeting of the Board of Park Commissioners. Uh, Dan, would you take the roll, please? Absolutely. Freckman? Here. Kladuski? Here. Paul is here. Kirsch? Here. McDonald? Here. Okonik? Here. Shabilsky? Here. Alder Shore? Here. Alder Swinski is excused. Sorensen? Here. Alder Zerazua? Here. We have a quorum. Great. All right. Item number two, approval of the February 3rd, 2021 meeting minutes. I'll move. Okay. John's made a motion to approve those. Any second? I'll second. Uh, Mike uh, seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Item number three, presentation on Emerald Ash Borer Biocontrol Program for Iverson Park, presented by the USDA folks. And Christopher Degan and yeah. Ellen, is there Ellen here? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Ellen I'm Natsuki. here. Yep. Okay. hello. Um, Dan, do you want to introduce them or? Yeah, you bet. So um, Todd isn't on the call yet, but uh, ultimately this, this presentation tonight is here because it started with uh, Ellen reaching out to the city forester, Todd Ernster. They're, they're going to overview a biocontrol program that they're uh, they're using and, and offering it to the city to try and institute or begin in Iverson Park. So um, Todd has looked through it, uh, came contacted me about it, and we thought that it was at a point we felt comfortable enough to bring it to the commission for review. And Ellen agreed to, and it looks like Christopher's here as well, give a presentation so that there could be questions uh, before a potential action item which will follow. So Ellen, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Good evening. All right, I'm gonna just try to share my screen here so you guys can see I have a little uh, PowerPoint presentation to go through. There we go. Can you guys all see my, my screen and my PowerPoint there? Yes. Okay, and you guys can all hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, as Dan said, my name is Ellen Natsky. I'm a plant health safeguarding specialist with the USDA APHIS uh, PPQ. So PPQ stands for Plant Protection and Quarantine. So we regulate invasive plant pests and diseases like emerald ash borer and gypsy moth. Um, and uh, so I'm here talking with all of you today because um, EAB has recently been deregulated um, so we are no longer taking a regular regulatory approach to EAB. Um, the federal quarantine that was in place to try to control EAB from spreading into new areas is no longer enforced by us. Um, but that does, you know, by no means does that mean we're kind of throwing in the towel on EAB. Um, instead of, you know, we're taking all of that um, regulatory focus and energy and shifting that into more of a management style approach. Um, and so EAB Biocontrol, you know, is the main um, tool we use to do that. And it's just a, you know, it helps moderate EAB population levels um, rather than trying to stop it from moving into new areas completely um, at this point. Um, so I'm here today because we are seeking approval um, to use public lands in Stevens Point for a release site for EAB Biocontrol. Um, and I'll go over all, what all of that means here in the next slides. <clears throat> so yes, Iverson Park is the site that we're seeking approval from you all to use um, for EAB biocontrol. Um, my coworker, Nick Zebro, uh, did walk this site in, I think earlier this year. Um, and he did um, confirm that it would make a really good release site. It met you know, the basic parameters um, that we have in place for release sites. 
which are that it's um, at least uh, more than or greater than 40 forest acres. It's got uh, greater than 25% ash, or at least 25% ash. And then of course, EAB has to be present um, at the site. So we have to see some visual signs or symptoms of EAB um, being there. So this is the site that we are interested in, in using. Um, so now I'll just kind of start by uh, going over the basics of what is EAB biocontrol. Um, and I'll go over the actual biocontrol organisms that we use. Um, so we, in Wisconsin, we use three different species of parasitoid wasps. Um, they're very tiny wasps and they're stingless. Um, they are all EAB's natural enemies from its native range in China and Far East Russia. <clears throat> and uh, they are reared here in the U.S. in a specialized USDA laboratory in Brighton, Michigan. And that's, that's that lab's sole purpose is to rear these parasitoids for EAB biocontrol for releases all over the country. Um, <clears throat> so we would release wasps at a release site on, uh, we try to choose our release sites to be on public lands, you know, that meet the basic parameters I mentioned earlier. So the places where there's lots of ash, there's at least 40 forested acres, um, and then there has to be signs or symptoms of EAB there. It has to be EAB present at the site. <clears throat> Um, the parasitoids either feed on EAB larvae or eggs um, at the release site. And then ideally, um, they'll establish themselves there at the site and then they'll spread, hopefully, spread to new areas from there. Um, you know, EAB has to be present at these sites where we do releases too, um, so that when we release the wasps there, they have a host resource to be able to complete their life cycle and survive. Um, and these, if you can see the, the slide here, the three wasps are pictured at the bottom of the slide. Um, the first picture there is o Obius agrilli, and I said they were tiny. Uh, this one is very tiny, it's the smallest of the three, <clears throat> and it's an egg parasitoid. So it will parasitize EAB eggs that are on the surface, uh, the bark of ash trees. Um, and it's about a millimeter in length, um, so it's very tiny. The next one pictured there is Spathia scalini. Um, it's the largest of the three and it's about the size of your average mosquito. Um, and then the third one that's pictured there is Tetrasticus planipanisi. Um, and that one's about five to six millimeters in length. So they all are pretty small, inconspicuous um, wasps. Um, the Spathia scalini and the Tetrasticus um, wasps are both larval parasitoids. parasitoids. So they will use their ovipositor, um, uh, inject their eggs through the bark of ash trees into EAB larvae that are just under the bark of the, of the ash trees. Um, these wasps only host is EAB. Um, they won't really parasitize any other organism. Uh, they had to go through, I think, you know, at least five years of very thorough host specificity testing um, before they were approved for releases into the environment. Um, and it was determined that EAB was effectively their only real host. Um, there were very rare occasions where they would accidentally parasitize another agrylus beetle. Um, and EAB uh, is the same genus. It has, it's an agrylus beetle as well. So it just par they accidentally sometimes would par parasitize other agrylus beetles. Um, but that happens so rarely that if that did occur after the, they were released into the natural environment, it would not affect those native populations at all. <clears throat> okay, so those are the uh, parasitoids that we would re be releasing at the site. Um, so now I'll kind of go over exactly what, uh, what a release means. Uh, when we say we're gonna do a release, what does that mean? Um, so at a, a release site, at a new release site, <clears throat> we would choose anywhere from 10 to 20 release trees. They're all ash, of course, um, on which we would actually do the releases. And um, we try to spread those trees out throughout the site just to help with wasp dispersal as well. Um, our staff would do all of the releases and all the work associated with the releases. 
Um, <clears throat> so it would be me or my coworker Nick or one of our technicians um, that would be out there doing the releases. That's not to say, you know, um, after COVID, hopefully when things return more to normal, um, we we couldn't have someone, um, if one of your staff was interested in taking along with us just to see what we would do out there and, you know, just to observe, that would be fine with us. We've done that in the past. Um, we just wouldn't expect you guys to do any of the work if you didn't want to, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is we do let the land manager know um, every time we'll be out to do a release. So we can let them know anywhere from one week to one day in advance of when we'll be out there, um, whatever they prefer, or not at all. Some land managers don't wanna know or don't care to know. Um, so whatever is preferred is fine with us. We can accommodate that. Um, we would do four releases monthly from June through September. So we would do run release in June, one in July, one in August, one in September. And at a release, we could um, release any of the three species of wasps. It would, could be adults, uh, adult wasps or larvae of the wasps um, each time we're out there. And we never know um, exactly what we're gonna get. It's not up to us. Actually, we don't make the decision. It's just whatever the lab sends us. Um, and then we go out and, and release whatever they give us that day. Um, so <clears throat> if we're releasing adults of these wasps, um, of any species, uh, we could release um, adults of any, any of the three species I talked about earlier. Um, those releases are pretty self-explanatory. You can see the plastic cup picture there in the, in the first picture at the bottom of the slide. That's what uh, the adult wasps would come in, these plastic cups. So all you would do for a release is just open, open the lid, you know, tip the cup upside down and gently tap it against a release tree um, in order to release those wasps. So they all fly out. Um, <clears throat> the, then we could release larvae of these wasps as well. Um, and we would either release the O. obvious larvae or the tetrascus larvae for whatever reason, we don't release larvae of the spathius wasp at all. I don't know why that is. Um, we would only release spathius adults. Um, so, but if we're gonna do obvious uh, larvae releases, um, those would, those larvae come in these um, orange medicine vials that are pictured here um, at the bottom of the slide in the middle there. Um, <clears throat> we call those o obinators. <laughs> um, so we would just attach those to a release tree using twist ties. Um, and what's in there is just coffee filter paper that has EABA or parasitized EAB eggs in, on it. And then um, the opening of that vial is covered with very fine mesh. So when the mature, when the oobius larvae mature out of those, they emerge out of those eggs and they can just fly straight through that mesh into the release. Um, then tetrasticus larvae come in these ash bolts, which is the next picture there uh, on the far right side. So those are just sections of small ash trees um, that have parasitized EAB larvae in them with tetrasticus. So um, we would just tie those to a release tree with string. Um, and then the tetrasticus larvae would emerge from those ash bolts when they matured and then be released out into the release site. So releases generally happen at a site for two to three years. So if we get approved to use Iverson Park as a site, we would start releases this year in June, um, continue throughout the summer, like I mentioned, and then um, we would return again next year in 2022 to do the same thing and do releases through the summer next year as well. Uh, it's possible um, we could do a third year of releases um, at Iverson Park, but um, that's not a guarantee. Um, but for sure, two years we would do. Um, so uh, after that second year, possibly third year of releases, we would be done with releases at the site. Um, and we would just leave it up to the wasps to establish themselves at the site and hopefully spread out to new areas from there. Okay, so I have uh, thrown a lot of information at you <laughs> pretty fast here. So I just will take a minute and pause here. 
um, to see if you guys have any questions so far with all of the material. Ellen, I have a question. Sure. How long, how long have you been doing this program? So um, we started doing releases, started um, learning about EAB, EAB biocontrol and doing these releases starting in 2019. Um, okay. Yep. And I'll go into more detail about that too a little bit further on. Yeah. And how's your response been so far one year in? So far it's been good. Um, you know, these, these uh, releases are, a lot of them are in pretty remote areas um, in um, like wildlife areas and, and those types of public lands. Um, the, the releases that have been done in more public areas like state parks, um, city parks, things like that. When we meet people, you know, out when we're do, out there doing releases, people are always interested in what we're doing and um, pretty interested and, and positive about it. Um, so, yeah. Ellen, is there anything that controls the wasp population over time? So is there any, I guess, control methods for their numbers? Um, you know, not that I'm aware of, uh, you know, besides the, the normal predation that occurs with any wasp of that size, um, like you know, birds and other insects and spiders and things like that. Um, but, and I will talk about this later on too, but, you know, these releases have been going on in like 26 states um, since 2007 when the first, when it, they were first approved for release. And um, there have been no uh, reports of any uh, negative um, results as far as wasp population levels or anything like that happening since then. Uh, what about the other side of it? Uh, uh, sure. Everybody gets concerned about it uh, affecting or preying on something other than what we intended. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, if it uh, lives strictly off the emerald ash borer, there's and it's doing a fairly good job. At some point, that emerald ash borer population will drop, and then the wasp population will drop if it doesn't have anything else to eat. So does yeah. does this mean that you got to reintroduce it, go through the same cycle again? Because you know, at some point or another, if you don't have the wasp and the emerald ash borer is fairly mobile, fairly fairly mobile in three, four, or five years, you're right back to where you started. Um, well, I think you know we so EAB has been around a very long time, um, and we have only started releasing these wasps in Wisconsin, I think starting in 2013. Um, you know, so we are, we are pretty behind the eight ball here uh, with releasing these wasps. They, um, they are doing a pretty good job of finding EAB and killing EAB, um, but I don't think they could ever it's, it's hard for them to get to the level to, to get to the same level as EAB has gotten as far as population level goes, um, where they would, you know, I don't think they would ever get to the point where they would wipe out EAB. Um, and that's really not our goal either with releasing these wasps. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, we hope, we hope that the wasps do a good enough job where the, obviously the EAB population levels will decline somewhat. Um, but then, you know, the wasp levels will decline. I, I think we're hoping to find sort of an equilibrium develops between the two. Uh, um, so, yeah. Ellen, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, will these wasps be making nests that my staff could inadvertently spray or kill thinking that it's a threat to our park patrons? No, these wasps do not make nests. Nope. They just live, um, they just parasitize EAB. Um, they, they don't make nests or anything like that in the environment. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, all right, great. So I'll just move on um, to 
to the history. I, you know, now that I've kind of given you the you know, details about the releases and, and the WASPs, I just wanted to take a step back and kind of give you um, a look at the history of EAB, EAB biocontrol um, in Wisconsin. So you kind of know what's been going on with this so far in the state. Um, like I mentioned when in response to someone's question, I think um, these releases um, have been happening in the state since 2013. So from 2013 to 2019, the Wisconsin DNR Force Health staff had been doing all the releases in, in Wisconsin. Um, so releases have been happening for quite some time in the state, and they've mostly been happening in the southeastern area of the state where EAB has been the longest and the, and the infestation has progressed the most. Um, and then, you know, in 20, from 2019 to 2020, we started transitioning uh, EAB biocontrol work from the Wisconsin DNR to our staff, to PPQ staff. Um, because in 2019, um, deregulation of EAB was already on the horizon at that point. So we had been directed to start thinking about transitioning our regulatory activities to biocontrol. And so we were starting to prepare. Um, so we worked, all of 2019 was sort of a learning year. We worked really closely with DNR staff um, to learn all we could from them about doing the releases. <clears throat> we did a lot of job shadowing, a lot of meetings and discussions with them. Um, so that was our learning year. And then in 2020, we started doing all of the releases ourselves. Um, so that was last year. <clears throat> and then starting at the end of last year and now the beginning of 2021 here, um, we've been looking for new release sites to use because most of the release sites we had been using last year um, were second or third year sites. So uh, those are complete. Um, we're not releasing at those anymore. Uh, so we had to start looking for new sites. Um, so that's why I'm here <laughs> seeking approval to use Iverson Park from you all. Um, we're also kind of looking to spread to new counties in the state where uh, biocontrol hasn't been, EAB biocontrol hasn't been done before. Um, and also kind of we're hoping to move in the northwesterly direction across Wisconsin, kind of trying to follow EAB as it moves north, um, north and west across the state as well. Um, and this, this is just a picture of an example um, parasitoid release shipment that we would get from that lab I mentioned that ships the wasps to us. So this would be a shipment we would get and we would go out that day and um, release all of the contents. And then if uh, you're a visual learner like me, um, this is just a, gives you a visual of where the releases have occurred in Wisconsin so far. So the red triangles on the map represent 2020 release sites. And then the blue triangles represent all the older sites that had release sites that have been used in the past. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about what our goals are um, with this project and what expected outcomes there are. Um, and I'll just start by saying that it's important to know that this is a very long-term project. Um, so, you know, we go out and do these releases and release these wasps and we wanna see results right away. Um, but effective results at most sites where this has been going on for a while haven't been seen until three or four years after the releases have occurred. You know, so right away, you know, after we do the releases, we're still going to see ash dying, ash declining, like we have been seeing. Um, but hopefully, we hope after three to four years, we start to see some of that turning around, some of that change. Um, and when I say effective results, um, I mean, you know, looking in areas where this has been going on for quite a long time, like Michigan, uh, Michigan's been, it's been, releases have been happening there, I think, the longest. Um, they've done studies to try to see what the efficacy of this is, if it's working or not. Um, and those studies have showed that wasps are killing anywhere from 20 to 80 percent of EAB in ash trees. Um, and along with that, we see, of course, um, reduced EAB attack rates on ash trees as well. Um, so it is, um, the wasps are doing their job. They are lessening those EAB population levels at release sites. Um, and then of course, I, you know, I want to be clear 
that this is not going to eradicate EAB and that's not our goal with this. I think I mentioned that in the beginning. Um, we're done trying to eradicate EAB, you know, we're past that point and that's not gonna happen. All we're trying to do with releasing these wasps is um, reduce the infestation pressure from EAB enough in our forests that the young healthy ash trees that are there can survive and grow and maybe some of them will be able to grow mature enough to produce seed and continue um, the ash component in our forests. And that's really our ultimate goal um, is to have ash regeneration happening um, at sites where EAB is present. Um, <clears throat> we want to see that younger generation of ash, you know, the seedlings and the saplings that are coming up now, um, we want to see them be able to grow um, into healthy young ash trees um, and uh, survive and remain a component of our forests. And, you know, it's also important to remember that this is just one tool at our disposal. It is a very, so far, very promising and effective tool. Um, but when combined with other things like, um, you know, woodpecker predation, um, <clears throat> and then also there have been studies um, trying to look at the benefits of using um, selective treatment of high value ash trees that are mature and seed bearing along with EAB biocontrol. Um, to help uh, keep ash alive <laughs> uh, in, in forests. Um, so those are kind of our, our goals and expected outcomes, outcomes of this. Um, and so um, I put this slide in here just because I know a lot of people um, have an aversion uh, to releasing non-native insects um, into our natural environment uh, with reason. You know, I know a lot, of, you know, people remember the, the bad things that happened in the past with releasing non-native species into our natural environment. <clears throat> and there have been uh, several of those and, and that have happened in the past. So um, I just like to present you with some facts here um, to help assure you that, hopefully help assure you that these releases will be safe um, and effective. Um, so I'll just start with a couple facts that you all probably know very well already. Um, the only way to guarantee an ash tree will survive EAB is to treat it with systemic insecticides. Um, and you know, you can't do that in the woods. <laughs> you know, that's just not a feasible option for forests. Uh, you can't treat every ash tree. Um, that's not economical. Uh, so. Uh, and then, you know, without mitigation at all, without doing anything, um, infested ash trees will almost certainly die within three to five years of being um, attacked by EAB. Um, so when you look at those two facts in combination there, um, the outlook is pretty grim for ash trees in our forests. Um, and that's why EAB biocontrol is an important tool that we have at our disposal. You know, it's been looking pretty promising and effective thus far. That's why, you know, that's sort of what <clears throat> USDA is mainly using now to combat EAB to help manage it. Um, and that's why we have a USDA laboratory that's sole purpose is to rear these parasitoids for um, the entire country, you know. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these wasps were evaluated and studied very thoroughly by USDA researchers um, for at least five years before they were uh, approved for releases into the environment, which happened in 2007, um, they were approved. So since then, since 2007, when the first releases were happening, millions of wasps have been released in both urban and forested areas across 26 states in the country. Um, and foresters and land managers have reported no um, deleterious or negative effects of any of those releases on our native populations um, since that time. So I'll just I'll stop there, leave you with uh, to digest the, that information and along with all the other information I've gone over already um, as well. Um, and that concludes my presentation. 
Uh, and if there's time, I can answer any other questions you might have or address any concerns um, that you might have with us using Iverson Park as a, as a release site. Anyone have any questions for Ellen? This is Makira. Uh, this might be a really basic question, but if a wasp doesn't sting, what still makes it a wasp? Um, <laughs> so there are a number of different um, things you look at with classification of, of, a, of a wasp. All wasps are in the order Hymenoptera. Uh, so they're all Hymenopterans, um, whether they sting or not, based on certain body characteristics and things like that. They, they are classified as wasps, they just don't sting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Uh, thanks, Ellen. The, uh, so the wasps can not only prevent future infestations, but also stop current ones or slow them down? Is that what I... Yeah, so what we're doing here is we're releasing these wasps with the hope that, um, you know, they, I think I said that we're releasing these wasps a little bit behind the eight ball with EAB because EAB has been around for such you know a long time here and it's been doing so much damage and we're just starting to release these wasps now so they have to have time to be released and you know establish themselves and build up their population levels enough to really make a difference um, in the EAB population levels. Um, and so you know the the trees the mature ash trees that um, have already been infested by EAB um, and are past a certain point will continue to decline and die. Um, but our hope is that, you know, by the time um, the young generation of ash, those, the seedlings and saplings that are coming up now, um, by the time they, they grow and mature to a point where EAB might attack them, the wasps that we're releasing will have established and built their populations up enough uh, to a level where they can help control that EAB infestation pressure enough where some of them would be able to survive and grow. Ellen, do you have another, oops, sorry, do you have another example of working with a municipal and releasing it in just like a, a municipal park or is this one of the first times that's happening? No, we have, um, we've worked with um, the city of Green Bay um, and De Pere, both of those cities, um, the city of Manitowoc, um, and um, I'm blanking on it, uh, Brookfield near Milwaukee. And we've worked with those municipalities as well in the past and done releases in those areas. Mm -hmm. Would there be some uh, public education about the program, like either through the city website or newspaper releases or something? Maybe that's something Todd I could answer it. I'm not sure. Um, well, so we have, re when we've done releases at um, like state parks and things like that, we have posted pamphlets um, and looks like flyers um, for people um, just so in case they're curious about it, um, things like that. But other than that, um, I don't know if, if Todd or Dan might be able to have a better answer. For you. We would want to. Um... Chair, we would definitely want to do that if it was approved tonight, just to put an information out in case there's questions or who do we could refer people to should something come up. Yeah, you can see kids that hang out in Iverson Park having to climb up a tree to try to figure out what those things are. So. <laughs> yeah, we do try to place them in, in inconspicuous areas. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't been on site at Iverson Park myself yet to see it. Um, but I would think with more than 40 forest acres, there would be maybe hopefully some areas where we would be a little less conspicuous with mm -hmm. our placement of, of some of the materials we're, we're releasing. Does anyone have any other questions or Todd, do you have anything you want to add to this? No, we could. Yeah, I could, I could work on that. I'm sorry, what did you say, Todd? Todd, the question was just if you had anything you wanted to add. Sorry if you didn't hear it. 
Nope, I, I, I can certainly help with uh, putting something out. Oh. Great. John has a question, I think. No? Okay, any other questions or any further discussion before we proceed? Do we need to vote on this or do we, no, not the presentation. We need to move on to item number four, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Christopher. And we'll move on to item number four then. Approval of the Emerald Ash Borer Biocontrol Program at Iverson Park in partnership with the USDA. So I guess based on the, the review and the information we've been given at this point, uh, staff feels comfortable, we're recommending approval. I'll make a motion to accept. Okay, motion from John. Any second? second. Matt? Matt is a second. Okay, all those, I, I have a pardon question. me. Makira, yes. yes. Is there a cost to this? I mean, I assume no. not because there's not one there, but yeah. <laughs> on the agenda. No, no cost, no cost. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any further questions? Okay, if not, we have a motion. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We look forward to looking or working with you and hopefully this will help with our ash trees. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank okay, you. item number five, award of site work contract to Green Thumb Sprinklers and Landscaping in the not to exceed amount of $27,082 for project number 20.054, Buchholz Park, playground development. So we were fortunate, uh, we received actually five bids on the site work. And what the site work ultimately entails is removal of the, the volleyball remnants or volleyball court remnants, grading the area for drainage, installation of the concrete border, which will go around for accessibility and the play space uh, encapsulation, the drain pipe, which will go out. Uh, so when it rains inside the wood fiber barrier, uh, as well as installation of some concrete pads for the bike racks and the benches and things that we're going to install. The playground install is separate. That'll be through a source well contract. But uh, this came in under what we were actually budgeting out of the whole $100,000 budget. The remaining amount would go towards that playground. So um, as you see, if you compare the bids, we did, we, get a, we, we did receive a very favorable bid. Rattler Corporation has evaluated it, and they are recommending approval, and so is the city staff to green thumb sprinklers and the amount that uh, was stated and is listed in the agenda. Great. Any discussion, questions for Dan? Or for Scott, I suppose. What's the date for installation for this, Dan? We're gonna try to have everything ready for a, a early June install. And depending upon weather and availability of the contractor, it could potentially be sooner. And that water line that we located was off to the east of it. Is that correct? Is that um, Scott, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe it was closer to the edge of the parking lot for the shop and then head, headed across towards the other bathroom and building. Yeah, that water line <clears throat> runs way uh, east of the open area, right along the woods line, right in line in the north-south um, area for the restrooms at the Buco Lodge, well away. Great, thank you. Good. And then Todd's crew has been down. There's some oak trees down there, as you're all aware. So Todd actually uh, and his crew met with the contractor, and we did some of the trimming now, so that way we're not working with anything to cause oak wilt at that time. So we believe we've got everything set to go now. Just need warm weather, which looks like might be on the way. I'm speaking too soon. I'm, I'm jinxing us. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to be here soon, I should say. Okay. I'll make a motion to accept green thumb sprinklers and landscaping as our bid. Okay, thank you, John. I'll second. Is, and Mikura is a second. Okay, we have a motion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, thank you very much. A lot of good information supplied in the packet, so thanks for that, Dan and staff. Item number six approval of exterior design and location of new restroom building in Iverson Park. Okay, some of the fun stuff, uh, kind of deciding what it's going to look like for arguably probably the next 50, 60, 80 plus years. Um, the restroom project, as you know, has been in the works for a long time. 
in your packets, you see a couple renderings. And really what the goal of staff here tonight is to go over the H and H study, essentially the bare bones, which was the last attachment in the packet. Uh, and then talk about kind of the rendering piece before we get working further on the site plan. So um, I have one drawing that I received late this afternoon, which I will share my screen on, but I'll call your attention to what was page 13 in the packet where it shows the ball field and it shows uh, some renderings about the ground elevations for groundwater. What we discovered essentially is that the preliminary flood elevation level is uh, 1070.2. Um, and then, and that was, uh, it's identified on the, the top box on the map. And then you'll see listed on it above that is what the existing ground elevation is in that location. So if you looked at where the current restroom sits, the ground elevation that's out there is 1071.2. The preliminary ground uh, or the flood elevation there is uh, 1069.4. What that means is, is the existing restroom is built above the flood elevation. That's a good thing. And if you look at the boundary and kind of the colored area, we're actually outside the boundary area. So in the existing location, what that means is the H and H study is confirmed. We are not impacting or in the floodway. So we're not subject to all of the floodway or floodway uh, zoning ordinances here in the city. With that said, we did meet with the zoning department and uh, director Karnowski and reviewed it. Scott and I did. We still believe and we recommend that we build it like it was. So put it two feet above that elevation. That way, should that change or anything with the climate changes or the waterway changes, we're already prepared for it. So if you look at that elevation, you'll notice we're only, was it two tenths of a foot for meeting the two foot requirement. So if we were to be building in the floodway, they would have required us to be two feet above it, right where the site of the building is, as well as a 15 foot wide in each direction berm. That's the short, shortest explanation. So here, if we were to build the restroom back near or outside the shaded area in the existing location or very near it, we're only going up two tenths of a foot. We're meeting the floodway uh, local zoning code. And, and also we don't need to, but we would, and it's not major groundwork or major civil work, if that makes sense. You remember that staff did talk about potentially relocating the restroom across the roadway. Mm -hmm. Well, as you can see from the floodway, we've, we've abandoned that, that decision or that uh, evaluation. We are not recommending tonight to do that because then we'd have to raise that elevation quite a bit if you look over there, it's, you know, uh, I think it's seven tenths of a foot just to meet that. So it'd be almost two, you know, 2.7 feet to get up to where we need to be. And then you'd end up with a big berm in the middle of a parking lot that's currently flat, things of that nature. So not, not the direction we're headed or, or recommending to go. So with that said, we were looking at if we were to go in very near where the current location is, what makes the most sense from a setting in terms of accessibility, bike parking, flow of traffic, and that's, this is the late drawing that didn't make the packet that I'm gonna share on my screen here real quickly. And I apologize, it didn't make it. Can everyone see this kind of rough drawing or sketch of the site plan? Mm -hmm. yep. So you'll, what I'll call out is this is the existing location of the restroom. We do have what we call our grinder pump and basically our sewer system that's located over in this location. And that, and you'll see kind of the water line on the site plan that works in. This is not the final site plan, but it's a pretty good sketch of what we're recommending. <laughs> I'll call your attention over to the open air shelter, which is what's depicted over here. This is not part of the project. However, as we look at kind of how people flow through the park, we know we're gonna be on this side of the roadway. We know this is the parking lot area that, that people definitely park in. But a lot of users are coming from this trafficked area, from the ball field, from the open air shelter, walking through from that other parking lot, as well as any traffic that might drive and park. But we talked about a potential crosswalk that we would either sign and paint on the ground. So staff is recommending that we would slightly slide the restroom to orient on more of an angle. And then we later on after this project, we could install the sidewalk so we'd have ADA accessibility all the way from the shelter over to the restroom project. As you'll notice with the restroom project itself, we've got a little bit more of a concourse area. There is a few trees, I think it's actually five in total that are impacted. They would have been impacted at both sites based on how the trees have grown around the existing building. So Todd, Todd's been involved with this process. We're trying to locate it where we're not impacting, uh, we're trying to impact as few trees as we can, but also place the building for long-term use, as well as then planting new trees around the, the new building. The bike parking, if we go forward with this recommendation, would essentially be on the, I'll call it the, 
I guess that would be the western edge and the, and the eastern edge to allow a, flow, a clean flow of traffic walking through it, but it allow those bicycles to be parked. Um, I am in communications and we'll continue to communicate with the representative from the bike and peg committee before we select what those bike um, hitches are. But we just wanted to call them out on the, on the plan that that's something that would go in. Um, as well as in the front, you can see we could have a planting bed in the location if we'd like. So the final location recommendation to the commission tonight is approximately in this location. We are still finalizing some of the utilities and the final design. The site plan will go forward to our permitting office and the zoning department before it would be approved. But tonight for our, our sakes here at the Park Commission, I'm gonna recommend we stay on this side of the road and we reorient slightly this direction. Uh, going back then to the actual photo of the, of the, um, the, the building itself, we are, are basically, as you can see, it's a block building is what's shown, um, but it's got a little bit more character to kind of match in terms of the uh, other buildings that are in the park location. CBS Squared is a consultant we're working with. They included that the write-up and they gave a real close kind of approximation or estimate of what the color rendering would be. However, that's not necessarily the final color. The idea is when we would be down in the park ordering the materials, we would try to match as closely to accent the buildings that are there. But what they do state, as you'll notice, is just a split face block concrete wall. Um, the roof color being either a mocha or a dark gray is kind of how they phrase it. And they're using a Sherwin-Williams lat color is what they've got listed. But again, what they're stating is we would try to accent it as close as we can to the buildings that are down in that location. So from Parks Commission, if you'll notice the rendering, what we're asking for staff tonight is asking for approval with the direction that it's headed with the final kind of color rendering to be selected when we're closer to installing it or building it in the field. And then one other thing I forgot to mention is you'll notice there's a bicycle leaned against kind of a leaning post in the front of the building. Uh, some thought maybe that was the bike rack. It's actually not. CBS Squared said that they've had really good luck with adding that for people to lean on or maybe they're using their phone on while they're waiting for a loved one or a friend or a family member or somebody that they're walking in the park with while they're using the restroom. So it's more of a kind of a waiting counter, they call it and an accent piece to the restroom. So that's what that was set up to be. Um, I think I've covered everything. So really tonight what the, what the direction or the feedback we're asking for from the Parks Commission or approval is, is the design and the look of the building as well as the location. And then from here, we would be moving forward with all of our permitting through the Community Development Department before we go out for bid on this project later this year. All right. Yeah. Is a hard surface outside the uh, restroom that was blocks? Is that Con most likely concrete? Okay. I mean, it looks like patio pavers in there. Yeah, their that... their re their rendering is a little bit. You know, they kind of move it based on the site, but concrete is what it would end up being. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I'd move to approve the design and location. All right. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, uh, Sue did the seconding. Is there any further discussion? It's gonna be a great improvement from what's down there. So, okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, those um, against, please signify. Okay, it, uh, it's approved. We like the design and the location of the new restroom. Thank you very much for your staff work. Thank you. Great. Item number seven, the division reports. Dan. I think uh, we'll start, what we got to set up is Kate's gonna actually go first and then Todd will go second and Scott third. So uh, Kate, I think is on the call, right? Um, yep, yeah, I'm here. Hey Kate, <laughs> go ahead. Hi. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. All right. Well, we got a lot going on on my side of things here. Um, March 1st, we rolled out a kind of a cool new um, community challenge, if everyone hasn't heard about it. It's called Be Active Wisconsin. Um, so over 40 communities are participating through the month, month of March, excuse me. Um, and it's an initiative to get people out and moving. Um, and it's a competition, really. Um, so uh, you have to log your hours every week um, after you've signed up and registered to be part of Team Stevens Point. 
Um, yeah, Dan's sharing the um, poster as we speak. Um, so those are all the participating communities on the bottom, um, along with Stevens Point. Um, so you log your hours each week, um, no matter what you're doing, whether it's running, walking, you know, yard work, whatever it is. Um, and then at the end of the month of March, um, the winning or the, the community with the most um, logged minutes would be deemed the most active um, community uh, in Wisconsin. So we are working to recruit some um, participants. So we've got over 30 participants right now. Um, we have registration open through, uh, excuse me, up until March 14th. Um, it's $10 to participate, but that, but that pays for your t-shirt. So um, it's kind of a cool initiative that we got invited to be a part of. This is the first um, time that um, any of the communities have been doing this and it's just a fun competition to be um, a part of. So if anyone wants any more information, we've got um, links on our Facebook page and the city website as well in the parks tab. So um, also um, due to COVID-19, um, usually the um, Learn to Skate program and the city of Stevens Point, the Learn to Skate program and the Crystallized Figure Skating Club we host a um, community ice show at you know at the end of our Willet season. Well, due to COVID, um, we we're unable to have that ice show this year. So we tried to figure out another way to keep those skaters active. So we decided to put together a little bonus um, spring learn to skate session. Um, and we also took the opportunity to add some classes that we normally don't offer to, to skaters. Um, in, including hockey one and power skating, along with like a jumps and spins clinic. So we've had great response. Um, over 153 participants have signed up for those classes. So that'll start here next week and then go through the end of our season um, ending on April 9th, I believe. So we're excited about that, a little something new um, in lieu of our annual ice show. Um, we are actively prepping for pool season, um, recruiting new lifeguards and cashiers, getting ready for the summer season, um, and, and working on all the, the pool pre preparations um, that go along with that. So, um, and my last thing I wanted to go over, which is kind of a fun activity, um, as some of you know, we are the, the city and, um, I, forgive me, who's the partner with it, um, Dan? Um, for the uh, the egg hunt. Right now, it's just the city for for a little longer. But okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean the oh, old one. Oh yeah. So, so typically, we partner with the radio station. Yep. The radio station. Yep. So um, that was canceled due to COVID nineteen. So we're trying to figure out what what can we do for the community to offer some sort of activity. Um, and other communities in the state have had great success with the scavenger hunt. So we are um, in the works of preparing to roll out a scavenger hunt to be in Iverson Park. Um, it'll be open for two weeks long so people can kind of do the scavenger hunt as they please. Um, we'll release the first scavenger hunt clue on social media and the city website. And then they'll go to that you know, answer to the clue to find their first object, and then so on and so forth. They'll kind of peruse the park, going from clue to clue, kind of touring the park and, you know, doing a fun scavenger hunt. Um, so it, we just wanted a, a way to um, offer another activity for people that's safe, uh, you know, amongst the COVID, um, you know, times right now. And so, um, like I said, other communities have had great success with something kind of along those similar lines. So we're excited to roll that out. Um, and that'll be open March uh, 20th as of right now. Awesome. Thanks, That's Kate. Todd, you're up next. Forestry. There, now I'm unmuted. Sorry about that. All right, um, what we have going on is right now I'm uh, looking at our city forestry ordinance and our permits and our forms and our specifications and we're just trying to update everything. Uh, there's a lot of old language 
in there and a lot of things that aren't pertinent and there's even some things that aren't legal anymore so it's probably a good time to to update that i think the last time it was updated mickey simmons did it and it was like 1999 so it's a uh, long overdue so um after that's done then we're <clears throat> then the next progression would be um uh, uh, re-inventorying everything including our new uh, planting spaces new areas of the city that were annexed for tree planting spots i'm doing a, a complete inventory so we'll apply for a grant this october for that and then the goal is after that is to um uh, revisit our uh, forestry management plant the, the year after that um, and have that updated to see how we've progressed since the last one in 2013, I think it was. All right, so that just kind of shows you the, the steps we're gonna take with that. Um, as far as the guys right now, uh, Ken Wanta, he is uh, still working on our small structural pruning. Um, what that entails is going from every year, he starts at uh, 2019 and he checks each individual tree and he um, does any needed pruning. Doesn't mean that he has to do anything, but we just try to get a good central leader, good scaffold branches. Um, so as the tree gets larger and older, there's less uh, pruning required. Um, there's less stored damage and we're starting to see this pay off. <laughs> so right now he is actually working on the fall 2012 planting list. So he's making very good progress with that. Um, the other two guys, Paul and Jonathan, they're working on a rotational pruning. They're in the, the courthouse area of town. And uh, I believe they'll be working um, along uh, like Center Point Drive, along some of our uh, parking lots that we have, some of the honey locusts and stuff. It's been a long time since those were pruned, so they're gonna be working in that area. Our city contractor who is <coughs> Zableski Brothers, they're also pruning in that same area, but they're doing larger, the larger uh, uh, pruning jobs, the ones that are that are just a little bit too tall for our bucket truck. And they're also working on city removal. So you may see them in some of your areas of town doing some removals. Plus they're also working with, um, uh, we've had a number of condemnation notices where people haven't taken the trees down. We've had to work through that, get the communication going and they've taken those trees down. So that that's very helpful. Um, Ken also today, as a note, is a sign of spring. He uh, started to blow the tennis courts off. So we're hoping by this weekend to have the tennis courts open. And that would be, uh, they would be open from now till June 2nd until uh, we start resurfacing the tennis courts and then they'll be closed for about a month. So uh, Dan and myself, <coughs> we're actually talking to the, uh, to our user groups, um, what that all entails uh, with them being closed. Um, as Dan mentioned, the guys uh, got things ready for the, uh, the new playground. We're also going to go in there before they start digging around those nice big oak trees with the, the root pruning machine so we can cut the roots so when they excavate there, they're, they're not tearing into the roots and ripping up towards the trees. So we have that kind of lined up already. Um, the parks department has three guys in Groleski Park. Did I say it right? Close, Groholski. <laughs> Groholski, okay, Groholski Park. Uh, Scott has three of his guys over there. They're cleaning up a lot of downed um, trees and brush down in that park. Um, we'll probably do a little press release on that tomorrow so people realize, because all they're seeing us is going in and out of there with a bunch of dump trucks full of wood and they hear the chainsaws going. So they've had a couple of residents drive by <coughs> and uh, verbalize their frustration um, digitally uh, so we want to <laughs> let them know we want to let them know that all we're doing is just cleaning up the, the brush and stuff like that so um, well uh, so I think that I think that'll alleviate any tension there and then the street department also has a bunch of guys that are uh, cleaning up brush along the Schrader connection along that section there's a lot of oak wilt along the side of the trail and it never fails on a Friday at two o'clock then we'll get a call of a tree going down across the trail so this should save us a lot of work with that um, without the trees falling down and we're doing it proactively. Plus I think they really, uh, it's getting a lot of firewood. We've been uh, working with a couple volunteer groups. <coughs> so this is actually kind of good. Um, they'll be um, helping with uh, at the Boy Scouts and uh, potentially the Wisconsin River Academy. They're uh, gonna help uh, pull some buckthorn in the sculpture park and also help uh, remove uh, garlic mustard over in uh, Kuzikuski Park, uh, where we're starting to try to establish our prairie. So that'll be very helpful. Um, 
And then other than that, uh, can I share, can you share the screen, Dan, for a second then? Yep, on the bottom, Todd, just click on the button. You should be able to go ahead and do it. Okay, click on the bottom. Share screen right next to the Share chat. screen right there, okay. Let's see if it comes up now. Just bear with, okay. <clears throat> We're working on our street tree planting. <clears throat> And I just wanted to share this one screen with you. Um, this is what our contractor and our guys will get <clears throat> when it comes to planting. Here, you, uh, this is just an example. You can see that at 2216 College Avenue on the College Street side. <clears throat> they're gonna be Todd, Todd oh. I'm sorry, I don't think we can see it. Can you click, is there an okay yeah. button on the bottom for you to click to open it? Hit uh, share screen again. Oh, it says share. There you go. Okay, there we go. Now we can see it. Okay, now we can, okay. So you can just see this is uh, what we could, uh, had through our old inventory. We're still working on this with our new GIS part. Um, that's more my fault, I'm, I'm slow to change, I guess. Um, but uh, at 2216 is where the address is. It's on the College Street side, it's site number one. This is a type of tree we're planting there. It's a uh, Princeton Century Ginkgo. Um, and then the Ginkgo location- is misspelled. What is, which one is, Bob? A ginkgo is misspelled. Oh, I did misspell it. Oh, yeah. you would recognize that. <laughs> no, but just, I'm just, gonna remember, get off the... just remember the question. Where did the ginkgo go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to get off this page fast in case I misspelled something else in here. All right. Um, and then the order number is just, that's just there so I can prioritize where the planting goes. <laughs> so we're going to get off that page. <laughs> So that's all, that'll be out. There's like 180 street trees we're putting in there. And then um, this is the, this is what's going in the parks. Um, there's a number of memorial trees that we're gonna be planting. Um, you can see that there in Buco Park. Um, also in, uh, uh, there's another one in Buco that Kodruskis are planting. Um, we're gonna try some um, American chestnuts. We're gonna try some Marginal trees here in Iverson Park, Yellowwood and Hardy Rubber Tree. Uh, <coughs> actually, I'm going to be buying a memorial tree for in Kuskokoski Park. We got some bur oaks, and then we're going to be doing a big uh, fruit tree planting in the NCCT property in the Yilgo Disc Golf area. We'll be meeting with uh, the uh, farm shed people uh, tomorrow to go over that. And. Are black and gum from, big trees? What's that? Are the black gum big trees? Well, that's one that Bob told me about. I was able to find five of them, so we're going to try them. They're, from what I heard, they're a slow-growing tree, and um, I only could get those at an inch and a quarter caliper for this for this first planting season. <clears throat> but they're supposed to have a real brilliant red color um, in the fall, from what I heard. Are and you're uh, Bob, the elms, or is that your thought along Main Street? Not, uh, we're going to use them in some spots. They're going to actually, so far, the, the sweet gums that we'll be replacing, I think, for the most part, they're going to be replacing the, uh, uh, the maple trees. We've been, we're going to take down a number of Norway maples, and uh, we're going to try that in, in those spots. Yeah, but you're talking about black gum, right? Not, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I was wondering whether they're going in places because I think. Um, wasn't there storm damage, or was that on the other side of Minnesota? Well, there's been a, there was a lot of storm damage throughout town, but um, uh, for the most part, we've replaced all those trees. Um, and to be honest, this planting season, with all the construction they did last year, and that's what I was going to show you in a second here. Um, oops, uh, now where did it go to? We're mainly going to be doing a lot of. Uh, uh, construction site playground spots, uh, construction sites that they that was under construction last year. That's what the majority. There's not a lot of request plantings here, and here you can see this is uh where my. Can you see where the arrow is, or yeah. not? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That that's along Fremont Street along the hospital. So the. <laughs> I was working with the hospital and they wanted to have smaller and taller growing trees there. So um, the green dot, the, the lighter green, the, those are um, honey locust. And then the, the smaller, like bluish shade, those are um, royal raindrops crab apples. Cool. Right? So 
So that's going down along there. And then at the end of the street, then uh, that little bit darker green, those are um, Regal Prince Oaks. So that whole road was redone. And then they did College Avenue. And there's a four foot boulevard there. So I, I think we might ask to change that to five for a planting spot because I think four might be a little narrow. But that's what we were looking at that um, demonstration sheet that I had. That's uh, the Princeton Ginkgo <laughs> and the, uh, and the uh, Regal Prince uh, Oaks because they're very narrow growing type trees. So that road was reconstructed. And then if you go to the north along 4th Avenue, we're going to try putting musclewood and ironwood up along that stretch. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that planting because we haven't tried that. St. Paul was redone, and um, we're going to replace uh, that. This was all ash on this on this street, but now it's going to be, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to replace those with hackberries. And then they also put the swales back in on Jordan Lane up here. So we got some service berry, hackberry, and some Kentucky coffee tree there. So that was another reconstructed street. And then this year is also going to be our 40th year as a Tree City USA, and we're also going to be receiving our 16th growth award. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to have our um, Arbor Day planting out here. This is out by Skyward. And I'm not real nuts on the tree species having Arbor Day with it, but all those trees, that's a um, uh, Crimson Sunset Maple. Um, it's a, it's a, it's not a, Oh, uh, is not it a, an Norway maple? Oh, okay, thank you, Bob. I, I was having a brain. Uh, I couldn't think there for a second. It's a cross between the Norway maple and a, and a, a truncatum, I think it is, Bob. So it's not a, it's not as invasive. So, or it's That's not, it's not supposed growing. to be invasive. So is that real fast growing? I don't think it's real fast growing. No, it's um, it's it has a globe shape. But initially, when they did this whole industrial park, they used all Norway maples with crimson king. And uh, fortunately, they all died. And um, we're going to try a different tree species in here that's somewhat similar to keep uh, to match those. So I think there's 32 of them in there. So I'm hoping to talk to Skyward. They have a good volunteer program to maybe have them come out to help us plant some of them. <clears throat> Plus, um, also, um, MSTC has a, um, an urban forestry class. They're going to come out and help plant the majority of these trees, but I thought that would be a good spot to maybe do our Arbor Day planting. And I'm thinking maybe the first weekend in, uh, in May for that. And then the last spot that we had of like of a significant planting area, this is out by Fleet Farm. They did Walter Street. <coughs> and um, here up on the top over here, we're alternating between honey locusts and ginkgos. And then farther down, um, it was Kentucky coffee trees and hackberries again. And then down this block here, um, uh, shoot, uh, it was, uh, give me a second, swamp white oaks and um, uh, uh, the same thing over here, Kentucky coffee trees again over here. So that's just kind of a snapshot of what, uh, then we have other plantings throughout town that we're going to be doing, but um, the majority of the trees we're planting this spring or it could be on uh, areas that were under reconstruction last year. And we just don't want to put more trees in than we could take care of. <laughs> so that's what I have. Is Zableski helping us? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, Zableski Brothers has the contract. We actually submitted that out for quotes. We just opened that, was it last week or this week? And uh, Zableski's, McKay's, they responded. And um, uh, Arbor Vantage, um, I think they'll um, submit next year. And um, first choice was thinking about it. So, um, which is good to have some competition in there. In the past, it's gone be between Chuck Eagle and his crew over at McKay's and Zableski Brothers. Excellent. Thanks, Todd. As you can all see, the, the new tree inventory, those visual aids are very helpful when, when looking at what's being planted where. So, thanks again, Todd. All right, Scott uh, Parks. Yeah, so... Um, my presentation is not going to be as lengthy as Todd's. But, <laughs> um, it's between seasons, so it's a less busy time for us. And uh, we're doing the little things that uh, we've been having on our list, like ordering PPE and working on tables and benches for refurbishing and that kind of thing. Um, I would like to just recap, give you a little summary of the uh, winter sports season. 
it um, was, I would say it's an average season. The season started for us shortly after the holidays on January 6th and then terminated February 22nd. So um, it, it, it was uh, well received and the staff at all levels had done a really good job with the, uh, the COVID restrictions and the sanitizing and, and giving the park patrons at least something to, uh, to do in, in Iverson and at Gerke. So um, uh, hats off to them. Uh, as far as private parties go, we had eight this season, which is average, even though there was no toboggan runs. Um, there are groups that still um, took advantage of the, the sledding and the skating there at, at Iverson. So that was good. And it was good to see that we still had some uh, private parties. Uh, moving on, looking forward to the spring, I have uh, applications I'm receiving currently and conducting interviews for our summer staff. I hope to have uh, the majority of the uh, positions filled in the next couple weeks. Uh, we did some staff training for our full-time staff during the cold spell. Um, a lot of the stuff on the CIVNIC website site with which is our um, insurance company, winter safety, slips and spills, back safety, um, driving in inclement weather, that kind of thing. So the staff uh, got a good shot of, um, of doing some online training. Um, the winter sports ski trail, we had some modifications that we've changed and uh, hope to implement and make a little bit more developed next year. We've changed the ski trail to be more, um, well, less sharp corners and more rounded so that skis can stay within the, in the trail. And we've also eliminated some of the ski trail to make it into a snowshoe trail, which is part of the uh, Green Circle Trail that's uh, south of the Boy Scout Lodge. We ha we've struggled trying to keep that ski trail uh, pristine without people having to walk on it or dogs walking on it or fat tire bikes walk on it. So we're gonna change it into a snow shoe trail. And uh, I hope next year we can uh, do some better signage to designate uh, one section being the, the ski trail and one section being the, the snowshoe trail. Uh, the staff is doing some preparation for Riverfront Rendezvous we're working on developing and, and making sneeze guards for our uh, food vendors to be a little bit more in compliant with what's going on with uh, the COVID-19. So we're, we're making those for our, our food vendors. And we're looking forward to spring football, which is gonna be at the end of the month. Um, we're hoping to have everything a go at Gerke. Um, weather is going to be dependent on what kind of facilities we're going to have for restrooms. Um, the will it will be available in case the weather is so bad and, and so cold that we can't get the east side and west side restrooms available and get the water up and running, but we will have facilities available. So we're looking forward to getting some activities over at Gerke. And uh, that's about it for now. Fun. Thanks, Scott. All Can right, I go right great. to the director's report? You bet. Unless does anyone have any questions for Kate or Todd or Scott? Thank you, folks. Can tell you've been busy. Uh, time for the director's report, Dan. Okay, I just have a couple small items. Um, I'm going to share my screen. The first item is the Plow River Crossing update. I, I've talked about this a few times, but we've had some really pretty good news or great news, I would say. Um, that, that I wanted to share with the committee. So as you recall, this is the, the project that I'm referencing. It's gonna be a connection trail that will take the end of Hoffmeister Drive where the uh, Green Circle Trail runs, uh, provide a bridge and connect over to the end of Ben's Lane. The reason I show this again, the update I wanted to provide is that there is three private property owners. Uh, so there's a vacant lot right here that the city was actually able to recently acquire. So this one was one that was a, uh, we were working on and that, that is, has happened. And then there was two other properties, the immediately adjacent ones that we were working on easements. And we have solidified uh, purchase agreements for those easements. So the good news on this project is that three of the large pieces of the puzzle we were able to put together. So at this point, the remaining uh, private property, not necessarily private, but other property owner is this town of Hull property. Uh, it's called Area Public Access. 
And we are in conversations and working with uh, town hall officials and plan to work that agreement out. At that point, we'll be able to continue moving forward. But we were kind of in a place where we needed to work through this first to even have this option for the route. Uh, and that was a big, a big break, being able to go ahead and solidify those agreements. Uh, there were several departments that worked on that, but I wanted to give everyone an update that that's really good news for that project. Dan, um, where's the uh, bridge go on that map you're showing right now? Um, it goes, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure anymore. I can pull it open again. Oh, okay. That's can, can you see it? I see Hoff. It, it's right, so right here is the end of Hoffmeister. It is set right now it's it's slated for right in this location okay. roughly right here so the trail would when it costs would come into an approach if you're following my cursor and then yes. we'd have a span that would go so the green circle right now is kind of continuous what we've talked about and the design will further solidify this but it's likely that the green circle would have some different signage and would technically kind of be at this location and this trail would be continuous right off of hoffmeister because we are if a tap grant is awarded, which is what the, the goal is, this would be cleared for snow in the winter. So we would open just the stretch from Hoffmeister down to Ben's Lane, the rest of the green circle would not be cleared. So we will work to identify where one trail kind of stops or is and the other trail runs through. But that'll come, you guys will get to see renderings and further design of that as we get further. So, but very good news. I'll tell you, when we started that project talking about the private property, um, that's always a that's always a, a difficult mountain to climb. So we were very excited that that was able to come to fruition. The COVID nineteen update was really um, basic. I just wanted to mention that, as I think everyone knows, we are working full time. Everyone's in. We still do have our mask rules in. So whenever we're in the same truck within six feet, we're in buildings or in other people's offices. We are maintaining the six foot barrier or the the mask mandate, trying to social distance, keeping up with our cleaning frequency. With that though, I did wanna mention, we are gearing up for our warm weather season. So we've posted all of our seasonal positions. We're gonna be returning to our full staff load as, uh, as organizations like baseball, softball, tennis, all of the groups that are coming back, most of them are coming back in modified approaches, but all of our prep work, ball field dragging, um, you know, the, the forestry crew, lawn mowing, all of that's gonna be for us preparation wise, normal so we need to bring our levels back to staffing what they were so um, that is happening those positions are advertised if you know someone looking for a summer job please look at the website um, vaccine eligibility i don't know if anyone looked but march 1st did take us into i think it's 1b um, if you read the definitions of 1b there's actually information about public employees um, so just as an update parks recreation and forestry is not part of that it's actually, uh, I think the definition specifically is 911 operators and then utilities so and transportation. So really uh, bus drivers, water, wastewater, uh, those that are, that's part of that. I wish park recreation forestry was part of it, um, but we're not. So I just wanna let you know our, our employees, we're keeping them up to date. We're sharing the information that we have from Portage County Health. Uh, we'll be prepared whenever we become eligible, but to our information pieces right now from the state, um, even though the, the public employees, there's a portion of them by definition of the state are eligible on the first, Parks, Recreation, Forestry is not in that group. Um, so we'll continue to work with our EM on that. And as soon as we're available to, we're going to try to help our employees. And at, we've already gave our team members the resources to contact their healthcare providers, you know, to stay, to stay in touch with the resources they have. Um, because as those group things change, there is a lot of questions surrounding that. But I did want to make that uh, mention. Lastly, then, I think Scott briefly touched on this, we are planning for Riverfront Rendezvous. So we're, we're trying to make as many modifications in our planning stage as possible, and we're going to continue planning. We've built in a 60-day rider, essentially, to allow us to look at a force majeure clause, or if, again, something would spike with a variant, or something with the vaccinations wasn't rolling out. So we're trying to have that for some safety for the financial outlay. And uh, we have made a modification to the fireworks already. They're, if they go forward as we're planning, they'll be in the middle of the river. So they'll be on a barge, which will then open up Mead Park, which traditionally you could not sit in. That will be open so people will be able to spread out more. Now, as you know, if you've been on a firework night, we need 10 Mead Parks to spread people out uh, social distancing wise, but it's gonna be a big addition because typically we only allow people on the ball field and then we fenced off the rest of the area. So we will be putting out press releases notifying everyone that that space is open, uh, hoping to encourage more space between people when they're watching the fireworks. So 
Um, and, and as it gets closer, I'll continue to update the Parks Commission on where we're at with that in terms of our planning stages. But we're, we're communicating with our vendors and trying to modify it in the, the best way possible given the information we have. So um, with that, that's what I have for the director's report, unless there's any questions. Dan? Yeah. Uh, Kate had mentioned the pools opening. What are you looking at for capacity? Is there? Yeah, so we're still evaluating the CDC guidelines and working through our, our COVID restrictions. So um, I, I don't want to throw a number at you right now because it wouldn't be fair. We're so far in advance, but uh, it's going to mirror very, very strictly with they've given some very thorough guidance now from the State Department of Health as well as the CDC. And that's what we're using to try to develop um, our locations. And we're also even working through self-cleaning stations for like say the, the chairs. Um, we'll have a more thorough plan and I'll be able to give you a more specific number when we get a little closer uh, because it has been changing you know, frequently. Every so many weeks, there's another update that comes out. And for baseball, softball, what are your numbers? Are we doing the same as football capacity levels or? Uh, based on last month's park commission right now, uh, we are telling them to contact the health department and work through their COVID plan and that uh, they need to wear masks, but we are not restricting their number. Okay, thank you. I mean, the latest news about supply really puts certainly June and July in, in a totally new light. I'll be interested because um, obviously who it's taking the longest to get to is kids, right? So it'll be interesting to kind of see. Uh, at, and at the same time, you know, as it's been, it hasn't been transmitted so much uh, among kids. So it'll be interesting to kind of see what, how that works with, with adults getting vaccinated. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think the latest, some of the reports we're talking about May and stuff, those are really good news for, uh, mm -hmm. for the summer. So, and yeah, so we'll continue to work on those plans and, and we'll continue to give you further updates as we get closer. But Dan, that 60 day window uh, that we have to cancel events or the entertainment for uh, Riverfront is that, so that means really by the first part of May, we have to make a decision as to whether we're gonna go or not. Yeah, essentially, and, and, and by cancel, it, it doesn't mean the city can just, you know, shut it down if, if things are, are you know, it's, it, the clause is built in a way along the force majeure. So health department warning, uh, spike, you know, they're, they're, it's built on reasoning around COVID-19. There's obviously some latitude given the global mm -hmm. pandemic, um, but those are the resources and the features that we would be looking at uh, to use for that decision. But yes, we would be in May is what we're kind of looking at. Last year, we took it down a little closer and, and likely this year too, if we were in that scenario, we do work with some entertainment booking companies or uh, consultants, we would, yeah, even the artists are in a, in a spot where they understand things aren't as clear cut. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, you know, I think everybody understands if we were, if a cancellation was something we were looking at, it would be based on safety. And, and I suspect everyone to work with us as much as we can. Um, but, but yes, it's coming up fast. May 1st of the year before we know it. Yeah. Uh, is um, rescheduling an option with those contracts? We could consider it. Um, the issue we run into is last year, at least when we were really looking at that, was the number of other events it bumps into. Sure. So where the free weekend was to locate it, as well as the firework, based on our financial model with Riverfront Rendezvous, firework night is a very large draw. And that's typically when the biggest sales return happens. So uh, financially, where really room tax um, sales at the grounds and the vendors is what allows the festival to break even or slightly and, and sponsors. Mm -hmm. If the fireworks isn't the draw like it is on the 4th of July, uh, the city would be looking at having to put additional financial resources into it. Um, so that plays a role as well about if we were to change weekends. But the biggest draw can also be the, the uh, most dangerous regarding COVID. So that's going to be a big decision. Yeah, it, it can, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. what the, the biggest pro we have is the fact that it's outside um, and, and human behavior of what the pandemic has taught. Uh, of you know, We have seen even for other events, not to that scale, that, that social distancing is, um, people are very aware of it, at least in the park system they've been. So hopefully 
as we get closer and other events are happening, because there's a number of things in and outside the park system, um, we'll have some other models to compare it to mm -hmm. here as well. And we're communicating with other other you know municipalities that are uh, that are are doing the same thing, kind of making plans as best they can. Right. Anybody have any questions for Dan? Any follow up? Great. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, item number nine, adjournment. We have a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mike. Motion to adjourn. Second by John. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much. Thanks to the staff for all the great reports. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, thank you. have a good, good night, night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.